Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Chapter 3 of his book, Philosophy as a Way of Life, Pierre Addo is concentrating on this conception of spiritual exercises, and it's, it's very useful to look at the types of spiritual exercises that he delineates and distinguishes from each other. Otherwise, there's a tendency to turn everything into a spiritual exercise and it all becomes kind of a mishmash. We, we want to be able to talk about broad categories of exercises that are different from each other as you could say as genera, as types, but you know, are, all have the same basic point of reference and orientation and which often reinforce each other. So as Pierre Adol points out early on in, in this uh, chapter, in, in the first section, we don't actually have any completely comprehensive and systematic treatises of these spiritual exercises, of these different things that are identified as here's what you need to do in order to live philosophy, you know, to do philosophy as the art of living. You know, there, there may in fact have been such for, say, the Stoic school or, you know, for the later uh, middle and, and, and uh, Neoplatonists or for the Epicureans. We, we may have even had some for the Cynics. We know that the Cynics wrote things down and we don't have any of those texts. What we do have are lots and lots and lots of allusions, not just to texts and, and you know, textbooks, you might even say, but also to different outlooks, to practices, to what different groups are doing. We do have a lot of individual exercises, um, some of which are found, for example, in, in Plutarch's treatises and in Epictetus or in other, other philosophers as well. And we even have some rather focused treatises. You could think about Seneca's you know, work on anger, his work on benefits, his work on the happy life. Each of these has lots of exercises within them or Plutarch's on the cessation of anger, which appears to have been you know, relying upon an earlier text by an Aristotelian philosopher, uh, Hieronymus or Jerome, who we don't have. And, and so, you know, we do have some focused works, but we don't, we don't have any sort of complete guide, uh, but that's okay. Um, Addo says, we do have some, some listings, you know, for example, by Philo of Alexandria. He says, thanks to him, we have two lists of spiritual exercises. And these are lists of kinds of, or types of spiritual exercises. So he says, one of these lists enumerates the following elements. Research, zetesis in, in Greek, which means seeking something out. Uh, thorough investigation, skepsis. Reading, anagnosis, listening, acroasis, attention, prosoche, self-mastery, enkratea, and indifference to indifferent things. The other names successfully, reading, meditations, melatai, therapies of the passions, remembrance of good things, self-mastery, and the accomplishment of duties. And he says, we can use these to give a brief description of Stoic spiritual exercises. Uh, and, and so that's what, what he does next. But he says, we'll study the following groups in succession. First, attention, then meditations and remembrances of good things, and the more intellectual exercises. Finally, the more active exercises. So, you know, this is actually quite a lot of different techniques or 
uh, exercises, however you want to frame them, that we can look at individually. And Ado says that we should look at the Stoics. Why the Stoics? Is it because the Stoics are completely right about everything? No, but we, we see this spiritual exercise tradition, at least in the texts that we still have. You know, if the Epicurean texts uh, hadn't been, so many of them hadn't been lost, maybe we'd be better off, but we see it more developed in, in the Stoics. So he says that we can look at attention as the first thing prosoche, attention, which you could also translate as mindfulness, if you like that contemporary term, he says, is the fundamental stoic spiritual attitude. It's a continual vigilance and presence of mind, self-consciousness, which never sleeps, and a constant tension of the spirit. Now, that's a, that's a stoic way of talking about it. It's not as if other schools don't also, in their own way, stress attentiveness or attention or mindfulness, but they may not frame it in terms of tension itself, right? What does it do? He says, thanks to this attitude, the, the philosopher is fully aware of what they do at each instant, and they will their actions fully. They can be committed to their action. Thanks to spiritual vigilance, the Stoic always has at hand, procheron, the fundamental distinct rule of life, that is the distinction between what depends on us and what does not, which Epictetus takes as being very important. Ado also takes as very important. Earlier Stoics actually didn't talk that much about that. They talked about a lot of other things, but you could talk about attention to those rules of life as well. So he says, as in Epicureanism, so for Stoicism, it's essential that adepts be supplied with a fundamental principle, formulable in a few words, extremely clear and simple, so they can keep it in mind. And we, we, he says we could also define this attitude as concentration on the present moment. So what does attentiveness, prosolke, actually do for the Stoic? He says, it's, it's the key to spiritual exercises. One reason is because it frees us from the passions, which are, and here he says something a little bit curious, always oriented towards the past or the future and to things that don't depend on us. Now, that's a curious thing to say, I'm, I'm telling you, because in the stoic categorization of the passions, as a matter of fact, a lot of the passions are responses to what is believed, correctly or incorrectly, to be present. Right? Present good thing, present bad thing. But we'll put that aside for, for a moment. Um, Ado is not recommending a sort of like living totally in the present man and you know, new agey kind of ways. But there, there is an importance in freeing ourselves from you know, past and, and future that are not particularly helpful for us. And he also says it allows us, being attentive, to respond immediately to events. And here's a really interesting turn of phrase as if they were questions asked all of a sudden. Ado views a lot of this in terms of sort of dialogue and dialectic between the self and the self and others and, and the world. So, you know, viewing the challenges that we're facing as questions put to us by the world makes perfect sense. So that is uh, an important set of spiritual exercises. Next, we get into things that are a bit more structured, and you could even say a bit more deliberately cognitive. So he talks about memorization, neme in Greek, and meditation, melete, on the rule of life. Now, it's not just meditation on the rule of life. There's all sorts of meditative or contemplative exercises that are intended to prepare us for particular types of situations or to help us better understand who we are. And he says that it, it will allow us to be ready at the moment when an unexpected circumstance occurs. So he uses a, as a prime example, prime meditatio malorum, the thinking about bad things in advance, which is, you know, it's a very important Stoic practice. It's used in other traditions as well, which may have gotten it from the Stoics, some of which definitely did didn't get it from the Stoics, but um, that can be helpful. Now, one of the things that Ado brings up here, again, is that there is a linguistic component to this. He says, what we need are persuasive formula or arguments, epilogismoi, which we can repeat to ourselves in dif difficult circumstances so as to check movements of fear, anger, or sadness. We can also do things like first thing in the morning, we go over in advance what we have to do during the day. In the evening, we engage in self-examination. And Ado goes on to say, 
Meditation is an attempt to control inner discourse, an effort to render it coherent. So the meditation that he's talking about here is not just emptying your mind. It's actually trying to empty some of your mind so that you can fill it with stuff that's actually going to serve you better and which you can build together in a coherent system. Now, the third type of exercise that he talks about, broad category, it provides nourishment for meditation and memorization. What do you meditate on? What do you, what do you memorize? He says, well, reading, listening, research, and investigation. Also, reading can include explanation of specifically philosophical texts. So studying. Research and investigation, he says, are the result of putting instruction into practice. For example, we're to get used to defining objects and events from a physical point of view. We must picture them as they are when situated within the cosmic whole. We can dissect events to reduce them into their elements. A prime example of this is in Marcus Aurelius when he's saying, oh, you see that, you know, really tasty dish in front of you, break it down into its components and you'll see that it's, it's really not that, you know, impressive and might even be a little gross, quite frankly, you know, uh, this is, this is a, a common practice. So that, that fits into these specifically intellectual exercises. We do these in a general sense. We do these in specific senses as well. And this is quite interesting. If Hado is correct about this, then you can't just practice a philosophy as a way of life. You have to actually study a philosophy as a way of life. And it has to be an ongoing uh, practice of reading and study, which interestingly enough is what the ancient Stoics actually told us, isn't it? Uh, it's only modern Stoics who, some of them, want to dispense with this, this aspect. Finally, we get to the thing that a lot of people are much more interested in, practical exercises intended to create habits. And he says, some of these are very much interior, you know, not just about exterior things, and very close to the thought exercises we've just discussed. For example, indifference to indifferent things, is nothing other than the application of the fundamental rule. Other exercises like self-mastery, fulfilling duties of social life, those require us to actually do something. They require practical forms of behavior. And there's a lot of things that are kind of in between, you know, trying to wean yourself away from automatic thought processes and responses that produce anger or sadness or fear, or anxiety, and towards, you know, adopting a more detached attitude towards these things. That's kind of in the middle. It's both interior and exterior, but these practical exercises, the goal is indeed to create habits. Also to undo older habits that are not serving uh, us well, those that subject us to the passions, those that have us engaging too quickly in processes of reasoning about impressions that are coming in. Now, what's really interesting here is these are not strictly just stoic, right? We could look at the Epicureans. We could look at the cynics, what we know of them. We can even look at the Cyrenaic hedonist school, which we don't have any, any texts of, but just, you know, testimonies about. And we can see a lot of these exercises being carried out, but in different ways. So for example, the Epicureans don't suggest that people should engage in prime meditatio malorum because they don't think we ought to try to make ourselves, you know, uh, think about things that are, that are disturbing and, and troubling and make us sad or angry. Instead, we ought to think about past pleasures or pleasures yet to come. We should think, we should direct our mind in different ways. So there's, you know, a different, uh, meditation going on and perhaps also different intellectual exercises going on, but they're all doing this, whether they're Platonists, Stoics, Epicureans, or even, you know, uh, eclectics of, of some sort. A little bit later, he talks about the Epicureans as, you know, treating pleasure itself as a spiritual exercise. Now, how, how do you do that? 
Well, by enjoying pleasures in a thoughtful, rational, refined sort of way, and also by <clears throat> using these other spiritual practices to strip away some of the fears and troubles that beset people so that they can, as, as Ado is going to say, the Epicureans thought that we have joy just in existing. And so that's, that's another possibility. He also talks about, in a, a very interesting section, uh, where he's, he's discussing dialogue. He tells us that the Socratic dialogue turns out to be a kind of communal spiritual exercise. Interlocutors are invited to participate in such inner spiritual exercises as examination of conscience, right? Meditation, mindfulness, and um, attention to oneself. And this, this ties in with, you know, self-knowledge, uh, the relationship of the self to itself, and learning how to dialogue with oneself. So there are some important practices in that respect that we also see coming up within the Stoics. And then there's a discussion about training for death as another, you know, we could call it not, not a, a subtype of spiritual practices, but as involving these different types as well. You know, you could be attentive to the fact that life is passing away, right? You can broaden your perspective uh, through how you think about things so that you can realize that, that your own death is nothing absolutely unique. Uh, you can learn about, you know, what the philosophers have to say. You can engage in practical exercises so that you'll have some self-mastery when you're in dangerous situations. You can persevere in them. So there's a number of different types of spiritual practices, and each school develops and deploys its own particular practices. Many of them borrow from each other, you know, because why uh, miss out on something that, that's quite good if somebody else has developed an excellent spiritual practice that, that you can make use of? I'll give you one prime example of this that spread across the, you might say, the curriculum of ancient philosophy, bringing before the eyes uh, your, you know, a conception of what you look like when you become angry so that you realize, ooh, that's pretty ugly. That may actually help to wean you away from the anger response. We find it in um, Epicureans, we find it in Stoics, we find it in Middle Platonists and in others as well because it, it's, Turns out it's an effective technique, right? So there's, there's a lot of overlap between these, but we can distinguish these apart from each other. And just to reinforce the point, it's very important that we do distinguish them because they're not all the same thing. And we want to know, well, what part of the mind or body or soul or whatever it is that we're working upon are we actually engaging and what sort of specific content or direction are we giving it?